So, hi everybody. I'm Stephen Heminger. Um, talking about a project today, which is a little project that I've been starting out called XNet EM, which the name I made up from combining XDP and NetEM. And uh, this was the best logo I could find to uh, bring into the slide just because it had baseball hats and mushy mer <laughs> So I'm going to talk about, let me get the notes up here, what motivated me to do XNetEM and what is it good for, look into a little bit of how it works and some the usage of it, how you would use it. Since this is kind of like the early teaser of it, of a project, there's a lot of pieces that need to be filled in and I'll try to go through that and some of the problems I've run into so far and I'll try to leave some time for Q&A before lunch. So, uh, sorry. Okay, the mo real motivation of this is not my employer or any great grand unified vision. I have hobbies and some of the hobbies I have are like woodworking. And when I do woodworking, I find really cool tools and then I decide to do something with it. And um, I pretty much assume everybody in this room has a basic idea what XDP is. Otherwise, you should go listen to another talk on YouTube or come back and hopefully you'll have filled it in from the rest of the week. But XDP is a really cool tool chest. And I want to learn about XDP and I wanted some example that was non-trivial but wasn't going to mean I had to do a whole startup company like Cilium. So this, looking at NetEM, it was just about the right size. And also what was really cool about NetEM is I did it and it totally blew up in terms of the number of contributions. By blew up, I mean I got contributions and research input that I never ever expected. And I'm kind of hoping the same thing will happen with XNetEM and I want to repeat that. And I also think that this might be a, a good use case to try to help the developers or to get people to use XDP more widely and get feedback about what's good and what's bad and what's hard to deal with. And I want to read this is a personal project, not something at all related to anything at Microsoft, but they may end up using it, you never know. The basic goal of this was to start small. And by that I meant deal with the basic functionality that already existed in NetEM, to break it into components not try to do the whole big piece at once, and to reuse existing technologies and software because the licenses are compatible, and to make it available to build a community. So let's take a trip back in time to where NetEM started. Oh, this slide has been real pain. This was supposed to be the original graphic of the original slide that I first put up when I did NetEM in 2005 at LCA. So it's somehow in the time machine, I can't seem to make that graphic come out on the display. It comes out on this. But anyway, so what I did was I built NetEM to test TCP. In 2005, we were bringing in all the congestion control algorithms from the research community and we wa I wanted to be able to test them and I wanted to be able to test them on an upstream kernel without putting out a million dollar budget to go buy some piece of hardware or trying to bring in some out of tree kernel patch that was barely tested and barely worked and didn't work on anything on Linux 2.6. So there was lots of other researchers on network emulators and there were several other bits and pieces around and you can see all the references in the paper to those and they 
they were a lot of the inspiration for this, and where possible, I tried to use their algorithm statistics. So here's an example of what a test that was run. Um, for example, you take TCP throughput, and this is packet loss at the bottom. It's probably pretty hard to read given the resolution, but this is like 10% packet loss, and down here is about 1%. And there's this equation that says for a loss-based TCP, the maximum throughput you can get is based on the segment size and a constant and the round trip time and the packet loss. And then you can measure different TCPs versus the model, and this one has Reno and Cubic. And for example, if you wanted to test BBR versus Cubic under packet loss, NetEM is a really easy way to do that. So after I did this and it got out there, I was really surprised where some of the usages were. I mean, I expected people to use it to test large-scale networks, you know, internet. Uh, going to Australia was the example I used when the original talk was because uh, it's 200 milliseconds to get to Australia. You have a high-speed network. Your TCP may or may not work. It may decide to either flood the network or it may decide that it's so far away that it's just going to give up. Uh, so that was the first thing that it, but then the next thing that showed up surprisingly was people doing Wi-Fi research uh, were using it as well to measure incremental packet loss and what that would do. And then uh, they didn't actually do a very good job of using it. I don't think they got far enough, but the people doing internet on planes. Um, I've gotten some feedback from some users where they're testing satellite links to planes where you've got even one or two second round trip times because you're going through satellites and they do intermediate boxes and does that all work? Um, people doing internet in cars. I've gotten some feedback from people using it to test internet in cars. Usually the feedback though is not patches. It's like, how do I configure this to make it look like that? Oh, well. Um, the most interesting feedback I got was a research project that was in Italy that was doing massive, large-scale internet games. And they wanted to make sure their servers and algorithms actually worked at scale, and they actually used it. And they actually produced some of the models that I'll show a little bit later. That's where all that came from. And the guys doing buffer bloat also used it. Um, Dave Tott and other people. and. That's even why he was doing the recent contributions to NetEM that showed up yesterday, was he was using it to test some of the, the buffer bloat on Wi-Fi stuff. Well, so what functions does NetEM have? The first one that I added in the original NetEM was the ability to delay packets. So you could say, my network is taking a lot longer, I'm going to Australia, make it look like that. The next one is packet loss. And this one was actually fairly easy because in XDP, there's already a 100% packet loss example. XDP1 is 100% packet loss. So we already have a starting point for what that looks like. Uh, duplicating packets. Turns out duplicating packets requires that you be able to do have some of the same underlying infrastructure as delay. So it's not really possible with current XDP. Um, packet corruption. Um, it turns out that packet corruption is actually not a function of so much of noise anymore. It's a function of broken routers. So people have routers that, for some reason or other, decide to have a bug where two packets get mangled together or a certain data pattern goes through a a FIFO somewhere and gets mangled. So it does happen in real life, um, and there are plenty of examples for that. Um, so how does NEC XNetEM work? Uh, there's a set of components here. The yellow is the actual core XDP eBPF program. There is a CLI, which is just a user space application that manages and runs all this. And then there's two, two maps that are shared. One map is a set of the parameters. The CLI sets a bunch of parameters that this program needs to find. 
And the other one is shared state, where the ex NetEM EBVF program wants to push some state back statistics or uh, states between runs of ex NetEM. The CLI for ex NetEM, I, I'm lazy. I didn't want to reinvent a CLI, so the CLI is basically the same as the TC commands that exist for NetEM. So the top with NetEM, you say, NetEM is built on a Q discipline, and you say, I'd like the Q discipline NetEM, and you can set a bunch of parameters, and this one is, I'd like to lose 3% of the packets and with a 25% correlation, with a 25% correlation. Uh, this is the same example of how it would look in X NetEM. So, just a side note about random numbers. First of all, we're not talking. Oops, we're not talking about real random numbers for cryptography. What we need for this is it's a simulation environment. So we want pseudo random numbers that do not repeat themselves, and that. So they have a long interval, and we w want the, the test to, to generate the full range of values. Back when I did NetEM, the only thing in the kernel available was a really crappy pseudo random number generator. So I went and took, I'm not a scientific person. I don't want to go learn about random number gen numbers from beginning to end, so I went to the GNU Scientific Library, and I was lucky at the time they hadn't done to GPL v3, and extracted what was at the time considered the best of the pseudo random number generators in the new GNU Scientific Library. It was a Towsworth one, and put it in the kernel. And I put it in the kernel first to use for NetEM, then it became more widely used in the kernel as PRandom32. And that function is directly available in the EPBF program. So just a long way of saying I get the same random number of behavior in XNetEM that I got in NetEM, and that's a good thing. Now, just a, a note about how these, switch this around, um, how these random numbers work. Uh, the random number generators you're used to uh, generate a number between 0 and 1, the random 32, generates a number between zero and the maximum 32-bit value, which is uh, for whatever, 42 billion or whatever. So 100% value is U in 32. So when I use XNetEM and I want to take a value like 1%, that's 1 100th one of a, the maximum U32 value. Um, all this math is done in the user space component. Uh, of XNetEM, and the same math is done in the TC command. So here's the simple, simplest version of XTP loss, the random one. Basically, if you're familiar at all with XTP programs, you have a little program that takes a packet coming in and then runs some C code, which is compiled into eBPF. And ignoring all the stuff that you need to do to actually there's a couple other, I mean, I, I took a bunch of stuff out to make it fit on the slide that every program has to validate the packets and so on. But the core is, um, go look up in the map that says, tell me what my probability value is. So maps, the first map has the first key is the probability value. It's a pointer to the value. You get the value, and then you say, if the probability is greater than a random value, drop the packet, otherwise pass the packet. Um, the other thing you'll notice here is uh, I kind of make these programs fail safe, so if it, can't if it can't find the value, it says the probability is zero, I'm not gonna drop the packet. Uh, it's a lot easier than trying to do error cases and print cases and all the other things for this kind of program. And it also passes the verifier then. Um, the way NetEM works, and I brought this into XNetEM, is they it has correlated random numbers, and this was actually goes all the way back to the original NIST net. So um, if you go back to your statistics, a correlation is um, a mathematical um, 
property of how two number sets are related. And the way it's done is you take rho, which is the correlation value, take the last value, and you add basically, so this is, like, this is like a quarter of the last value plus one minus a quarter, three, quarter, three quarters of the next random number value. Um, and it's implemented this way um, by basically taking the last value, multiplying by rho a constant, and then doing a correlation shift. Uh, this kind of loss correlation is mathematically correct. There was actually a little, I had a little worry because the paper that the, the guys did the large scale gaming said, this doesn't work as a loss model. And I said, hmm. And I went through as part of the X and EM and wrote some test programs and did a million values, recalculate this, calculate the statistics on it. And yes, this does produce the correct value. So why was it a problem for them? The real answer, if you read the fine print of the paper is, this doesn't match how the internet does loss. So it's a mathematical model that's a poor fit for what happens in real life. So what happens in real life on, ne real life on networks is something like this. Um, this is a simplified two-state model where you basically, you're in a good state, you're passing data, everything's good, and then you hit some percentage, say 1% of the packets, and you go into a bad state. And there's a higher probability that the next packet will be dropped as well until you finally get out of that. So it's the typical loss on the internet is you're hitting a router and the router is congested. And it will be congested for some burst interval, say a few microseconds while the queue's full, and all your packets will be dropped then, and then you'll get through. So the guys who did that gaming came up with a general intuitive model, which has a different set of parameters basically between What's your probability of getting from one state to the other, good to bad, and what's your probability of getting out of it? There's another one that's even more complicated that basically says, I'm in the good state, and I may go into a bad state because I got a congestion event, or I might drop a packet just because of line noise. So they have a four-state model where you're basically, I'm in the good state, but or now I'm congested, or I just got hit by a radio uh, Wi-Fi burst and one packet's gone. So you kind of have a bimodal distribution. The point of all this is these are research models and they were trivial to bring from NetEM over to XNetEM. And I didn't have to go I didn't have to go invent new models or do anything really complicated there. And the code base this these go into XDP really easily. Now, package corruption. Uh, this also is in XNetEM, but it's important to realize this is not, this is packet corruption at level three. So this is not, not something that you're trying to validate the CRC on the hardware. You're trying to validate the higher level protocols. It actually does what broken network switches do, and internally, there was a recent bug where it turned out we weren't, uh, people hadn't implemented the Hyper-V network driver correctly, that they weren't looking at the, real, the correct bit to indicate bad checksum. And it turned out NetEM was really trivially easy to put into regression tests to make sure that didn't happen again. And I think the same thing, it's generally useful for any protocol. Um, we all know that you can't assume a network's perfect from beginning to end. And also looking at this, the current NetEM model, I will admit, is very simplistic. It just has random number and correlation. It would be nice if the NetEM model was more sophisticated and did, uh, well, it's not just one bit loss. It could be, uh, you know, I got zeros for 10, 10 bits or something because there's there are checksum algorithms that don't handle multi-bit errors correctly, and it would be good to be able to test those. So how does corruption work in XNet AEM? Basically, we do the same kind of look up the map element to get the probability, and then if the probability is greater than a random value, we go choose a bit somewhere in the packet, an offset, and we go flip the bit. Um, 
And uh, there wasn't really an example for this, but the example I was basing this off of, if you look at XDP, there's examples when you're doing actual real correct modifications of a packet like packet forwarding. So we're just doing malicious packet stuff. Now, when I was doing XNET EM, I really didn't I really didn't want to get into second system syndrome. I didn't want to reinvent what was already done. So I don't know if you can read this back there. It says, I will not, the dad's writing, I will not say, since we're doing this, how about, and the kid's busy at the bottom writing the same thing. Um, I really, you really have to resist the temptation to over-engineer this. As I started getting into it, I said, oh, I could start building a um, packet matching algorithm in front of this and then decide to delay packets and then I could decide to some percent of the packets route over different methods. It's like, I'm inventing a whole packet pipeline for just the network emulator and I, I, I don't want this to explode that way. Um, it probably doesn't make sense to make this thing blow up into a huge part of a whole project, it would lose its focus. And I would also lose the opportunity to grow the community and to get feedback and integrate ideas if it was a huge beginning dead packet pipeline. So, so what's there? So far I've done a proof of concept of loss and corruption. Uh, before I get uh, prob and the next steps are easy. It turns out with XDP, you can combine parts. So you could say, I want to lose 1% of the packets and damage 0.1% by chaining the XDP programs. So I want to be able to do that. Uh, this is yellow. I don't know why yellow doesn't show up on these slides. Um, I also want to implement policing. So you can say, uh, I want to, any packets over a megabit I want to drop. Um, and also use it explicit, add explicit congestion notification as an option. So you can, instead of dropping the packets, you can set the ECN bit. The harder ones that NetEM has that delay reordering and duplication need some work and discussion on the infrastructure of XDP to make that happen. But we'll work on that going forward. Um, I think uh, XNetEM is uh, about ready to be submitted upstream, but initially I thought I'd put it as a separate project up on GitHub, and I thought that might attract more people, but it turns out that for internal reasons, it's actually much easier to, to, for me to submit something to the kernel because it's an existing project. If I want to start another project on GitHub, I have to go through a whole bunch of legal stuff, and that's probably less useful of my time. And I also want to raise the question of how important is it to stretch XDP to do the things that NetEM does, or, do, or are they really worth doing? Um, for example, it's not, the whole point of doing XDP was to get the better performance. And I don't view XNetEM as something to replace NetEM. I view it as a solution for those high performance use cases. So if somebody's trying to emulate a one megabit Wi-Fi network and NetEM can do it fine, it doesn't do anything useful to reinvent it in XDP. But if somebody wants to emulate I've got a 40 gig optical network and we can't even come close to doing that with NetEM. That's a useful use case. And also I don't want to invent, uh, create technical debt in the XDP environment for what is a special wart. We always see a little bit of that with NetEM in the kernel because the way it plays with control blocks on the SKB it's the only queuing discipline that plays that game. And it hasn't really produced a lot of bugs, but it's every bit of semantic thing you do 
creates a burden for everybody to evaluate and review it and make sure it's correct. And I don't want to really create a lot of special cases here. Uh, just a note about policing. I'm now going to break what I said. And I want to implement a slightly richer policing model in XNET EM than is there in the basic Ingress model of Linux. And basically, it's really trivial to do the RFC version where you have two colors of policing. You basically have two token buckets. One is the yellow bucket, one is the red bucket. And so basically, if you hit the yellow threshold, we'll start marking the packets. If you hit the red threshold, we'll start, start dropping the packets. And turns out that there's several versions of this available in licenses that we can just I can just grab in Dex. NetEM. Um, there's one in DPDK, there's another one in FreeBSD, both of which can be sucked in. The delay one is a hard problem. Um, I put a big pile of cable here because when it, before I did NetEM, when I was talking to the TCP researchers, I actually went down to uh, uh, University of California in Pasadena and they had two one kilometer optical cable racks and they would take and they would run the cable, they would wave split and so they could get like 400 kilometers of delay through a real optical cable. Um, and the problem with delay in XDP is it breaks the current model where the every it kind of expects a packet will come in and it will not live around for a long time. It kind of assumes a work conserving model and with this, you didn't need to store packets and re-inject them, and you'd also need timers. And my thought is, A, how useful is that? Uh, B, at what bounds do we need to do that? And the C is some of the hardware already has pacing and uh, other things in the hardware. Is, is there a way or can we figure out a way to work with some of the hardware at the higher speed network cards to say, please send this packet three microseconds from now um, and use the hardware to do that role. Uh, lastly, um, I was so pleased with all the contributions to NetEM and I want the same thing this to happen with XNetEM. And so I plan to do multiple presentations and roll things out to create interest. And I'd also like to figure out if it's possible to get some code sharing with other projects. I mean, I've had good feedback from the BSD and DBDK community about these kind of things. It would be nice to have, you know, one set of good models across a wider community. Um, and my last slide here, I really don't like to do these kind of slides. I'll tell you why. It's kind of like the guy who puts kanji on his arm and doesn't know what the kanji means. But <laughs> um, thank you very much. And uh, I would, I'll be glad to take some questions. Yeah, I, w I wanted just to com comment on, your, on the SKBCPUs in uh, NetEM. Uh, there is no more um, strange thing here on NetNext. We only store the time to send for the SKB. Right. Um, right. Anybody else? Well, the uh, the problem there is that NetEM needed a metadata, a piece of metadata, and we didn't have any good place to put it. And I think the same thing will be true no matter what we do with XDP. You need some metadata that's specific to the algorithm. Somewhere way in the back, uh, Simon in the back. is. Uh, hi, Stephen. Uh, you mentioned about doing two-band policing in XTP potentially. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, doing two-band policing in the the kernel itself, like the normal QDisk regime? Uh, <laughs> it could be done. I was just trying to do things in. Mm -hmm different ways that were easy and fast. Can I comment on that? Because you can take the current police on TC, you just have to cascade two of them. Yeah, that's right. true, you could do that. Right, but uh, it may be easier sometimes to just
have one monolithic piece that does both colors. Yeah. It's like, uh, just Jamal, to use an example, at one point I actually went to the trouble of setting up flow-based red. It's possible. It's just, it, require, it requires about two weeks worth of effort to figure out how to configure everything. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just <laughs> th th there's reasons, that sometimes it's okay to do something monolithic like yeah. that. All right. Uh, thanks, Steve. Oh, thank you. Thank you.